إنه هو السميع العليم طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى صلاة مستقيم صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه واختفى أثره إلى يوم الدين After praising Allah Jalla wa ala and sending his salutation for the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa peseed. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has gathered us here uh, this afternoon. And we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to make us from those who hear the speech and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. And we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to make this gathering a blessed gathering. And we ask Allah jalla fi ula to make us from those who it said to Disperse, you have been forgiven and your sins have been changed to good deeds. And we ask Allah to make us from those who are guided and those who are increased in guidance and those who others are guided through them. Uh, the topic that we are discussing today, it is an extremely important topic. And uh, I believe that the theme of this conference, it is patience right and patience it is from the most important acts of worship now before we go into our topic we need to understand and comprehend what exactly is patience right in order for us to be patient we need to know the reality of patience right the ulama rahimahumullah azza wa they define patience as habsun nafsi fi ma takrah Allah to Restrain the soul within what it dislikes to attain the pleasure of Allah. To restrain the soul within what it dislikes to attain the pleasure of Allah. طيب. Now we've understood that. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he tells us, حُفَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ بِالْمَكَارِهِ وَحُفَّةِ النَّارِ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ He said that Jannah has been surrounded with what the soul dislikes. And the hellfire has been surrounded with what the soul desires. Uh, so what does that teach us? That teaches us that if you want to attain Jannah, you have to be patient with what the soul dislikes to get to Jannah. Because naturally the soul dislikes what we are commanded to do, right? It's not inclined towards it, perhaps. It is not inclined towards certain acts of worship, perhaps, right? But in order to get to Jannah, huh, you have to leave the desires, things that are the haram, that the evil soul it is calling you towards, right? And... Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, azza wa jal. He has a beautiful statement. He says, rahimahullah, in his book, Madaraj al-Salikin, that all of evil, it comes from the soul, right? And nafs. So you need to understand the reality of your nafs. If you understand your nafs, your soul, right? Then you will understand, you will know how to treat it, right? Because you need to know the illness first in order to treat it, right? And he says the nafs, okay, the soul, the problem with it and where the evil comes from is due to two reasons. He says the first reason it is al-jahl, ignorance, right? And because of the ignorance, it does evil. It calls you towards evil. So he said, how do you treat that ignorance? bil nafi with beneficial knowledge, right? And what is beneficial knowledge? Ya Torah. Beneficial knowledge is that what Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran. Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءَ Verily those who fear Allah, as he deserves to be feared. The only people who fear Allah properly are al-ulama, the scholars. Why? Because the more knowledge you have, the more you should fear Allah. So beneficial knowledge, what do you understand from that? Beneficial knowledge it is knowledge that increases you in the fear of Allah and consciousness of Allah Azza wa that is how you treat ignorance. And then he says the second reason, okay, that the soul, it causes it towards evil, it is due to bulm, oppression, right? It oppresses itself. It oppresses others, right? And how, do you, how does one oppress himself? Huh? You may think, how can I oppress myself? That makes no sense. By disobeying Allah, you oppress yourself. Because Allah, he says, 
وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعظه يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم لقمان الحكيم he said his son whilst advising his son يا بني oh my son لا تشرك بالله do not associate partners of Allah why? إن الشرك لظلم عظيم برولي شرك أسوسي إبارنز والله it is great oppression يعني are you oppressing Allah كلا no you're oppressing yourself right I'm not saying the ulama رحمهم الله عز وجل they divide oppression into three categories the first it is oppression that Allah عز وجل does not forgive if you die in that state and that is أسوسي إبارنز والله if you die in that state يوم القيامة Allah will forgive you but if you repent in this world Allah will forgive you that's the first time. The second time, it is oppression that Allah Taala will always hold you accountable for, unless the one who you oppress forgives you, and that is oppressing others, other human beings, the creation, oppressing the creation. Because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Do you know who the bankrupt was? In bankrupt one is the Sahaba. They said, the muflis, the bankrupt is the one who has no money, Ya Rasulullah. He said, no, the bankrupt is the one who comes Yom Al Qiyamah with a lot of salah." A lot of siyam, a lot of sadaqa, etc. Many good deeds. But what has he done? He has backbited so and so. And he has, you know, stolen the wealth of so and so. He has oppressed so and so. He has killed so and so. I, he oppressed the creation and then it will be taken from his good deeds, given to them. When he has no good deeds left, then his, their sins will be given to him. Well, and then he'll be dragged to the hellfire. That's the second time. The third type, it is oppression that Allah may forgive you for if you don't repent from it in the dunya Allah may forgive you and that is the sins that you commit when you do sins that are between you and Allah Allah may forgive you from his infinite mercy okay so the soul it is oppressive right and it is, it is these two matters how do you cure the dhulm you cure it with al-amal al-salih with righteous deeds by increasing righteous deeds, it gets rid of the oppression, right? Rather, it expiates it. As the Messenger Ali Salatu said, Follow up an evil deed with a good deed, it'll wipe it away. very al-hasanat, the good deeds. And this is referring to salah. Yudhibna al-sayyi'at. They expiate and they get rid of the sins. Dhaqika dhikra lil-dhaqirin. And that is a reminder for those who remember. Tayyip. So it is, this is where all evil it stems from. So, once you understand the soul, it is restraining it. Right? That's what patient is. It is restraining it from what it desires. That haram, that evil. And keeping it within, huh? What it dislikes, perhaps. And patience, ayyuha al ikhwa wal akhawat, it is three types. Okay? Sorry, maybe I'm turning this into a, a lesson where you have to take notes and one, two, three points, huh? But inshallah ta'ala, maybe I'm trying to simplify it. But it's three types. Uh, when you can't see who's in front of you, you can't see if they are actually following, uh, you have to keep giving them one, two, three and see if they remember at the end. So, watch out. I might ask you then, if you don't know, la ilaha illallah. Three types of patience, as Ibn Qaybi mentions. The first type of patience, it is الصبر على طاعة الله Patience upon the obedience of Allah. Okay, in order to worship Allah, it requires patience. Waking up for Salat al-Fajr, it requires patience. Making wudu with cold water, uh, when it's the cold winter, uh, for Salat al-Fajr, it requires patience. Being dutiful to your parents requires patience, and so on. Right? That's the first type. And that is the best type, by the way. The best type of patience is to be patient with the obedience of Allah. As the ulama they mentioned. The second type, it is الصبر عن معاصي الله. It is patience in refraining from the disobedience of Allah. Ah, You're not doing haram, it requires you to hold yourself back. That is patience. Okay? We assume that patience, it is only when a calamity strikes, I am going to be patient now. Ah, it's not. That's a third type. Category of patience. الصبر على أقدار الله المؤلمة. Patience upon the painful decree of Allah. When a calamity strikes, a loved one passes away. 
you're afflicted with illness and so on. All this is a painful decree of Allah Azza wa Jalla. You're patient with it. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Innama yuffa sabirun ajrahum bi ghayri hisab. Verily, those who are patient, they are granted their reward without any account. Meaning the reward of patience, it is great. Allah did not specify, indicating how great it is. Yom al you shall be astonished. You will be shocked because how great the reward of patience. Mountains are rewards. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us that. But yeah, now we have understood patience and the categories of patience. Our topic, it is the weapon of the believer. It is what? Dua. And even dua, ya jama'at al-khair, it requires patience. Mm. Dua, it requires patience. You might have heard this in your conference because I assume one of the speakers has mentioned it, right? Ayyub alayhi salam. Ayyub alayhi salam, Allah mentions in Surah Al-Anbiya, right, the different stories of the different prophets. And he mentions Jalla fi ula, the way they called upon Allah. And if you look at the way they called upon Allah, it is absolutely amazing, exemplary. Right, the way they called upon Allah and they called out to Allah Jalla fi Ula. Let's start with the beginning of the page. Allah says, Wayubaid Nada Rabbahu andi Masani Abdur Ta Arham Rahimim. Ayyub Ali Salam, who was afflicted with illness for many years. Right, he lost his wealth, he lost his family. Right? He was patient, extremely patient. And at the beginning of the illness, he never made dua. He never asked Allah to remove this from him because of shyness, because the, the first half of his life he, was, he had so many blessings and things were going so well. So he said, I have to be patient with this and I'm not going to ask Allah Azza to remove it so that I can make up to, so that I can make up for the, you know, the years of blessings and the, 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 the na'am that I had, right? So he didn't make dua straight away. Rather, after a long period of time, he made dua. And look at the way he made dua, he says, Idna da Rabbah. Allah says, when he called upon his Lord, he said, Wa ayyuba idna da Rabbahu anni masani al-dur. My Lord, I have been afflicted with harm. Wa anta arham al-rahimim. وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ He said, my Lord, I have been afflicted with harm and you are the most merciful. First of all, he didn't say, Ya Allah, you afflicted me with this illness. لا. Look at the etiquette. He didn't say, Ya Allah, remove this from me either. Rather, he said, you Allah, you are the most merciful. He didn't even ask, subhanAllah, because of how shy he was. What does Allah say? فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرٍّ وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا Allah says, straight, as soon as he said that, we responded to him straight away, Allah says. And straight away we removed that harm that he was afflicted with, the illness, all the difficulty he, was, he had, that he endured. Allah says, we removed it from him straight away. As soon as he said, Allah removed it. And he says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ And we, we gave him his family, and, you know, and like them, with them, and yani offspring and so on. رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا As a mercy from us, Allah says. Allah grant him that mercy as a mercy from us. SubhanAllah. Because he could upon Allah, وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ You are the most merciful. Allah granted his mercy. Allahu Akbar. Hmm. That is patience in dua. And dua, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches us 
at this great weapon that we have in order for it to be more accepted because when you make dua, it's accepted anyway as a believer but for it to be more accepted there are certain etiquettes that we should follow number one it is al-ikhlas that we are sincere in making dua we are sincere in making dua because dua it is an act of worship but it's like any act of worship it requires sincerity Without sincerity, Allah will not accept it. So it requires you for you to do solely for Allah that your heart is focused only on Allah when you're making this dua. Nothing else and no one else. That is the first etiquette. The second etiquette, it is that it is recommended. It is not a must. It is recommended that you face the qibla. You face the qibla when you make dua. Right? It makes your dua more accepted, but it's not a must. You face the qibla, Mecca. That is number two. Number three, it is that you raise your hands when permitted. At the time that make, making, yani, you're raising your hands is permitted, you raise your hands because it makes your dua more acceptable. As the Messenger Ali Salatu Salam said, Inna Allah Hayi Kareem Yastahi min Abd Ida Rafa Yadehi and Yarudda Huma Sifran Khaibatain. Allah Akbar. Look at this. He said, Rabbi Allah is shy and generous. And he becomes shy of his slave when he raises his hands to Allah that Allah returns his hands empty without nothing. Rather, every time you raise your hands, Allah will give you something. Raise your hands when permitted. That's number three. Number four, it is to start your dua by praising Allah and glorifying Allah. Don't ask straight away. Like, it's from the etiquette that you start by praising Allah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك سبحان ربي الأعلى سبحان ربي العظيم سبحانك ربنا ما أعظم All these words praising Allah عز وجل glorifying Allah جل في علاه right that is number four the fifth it is that you send salutation upon the Messenger Ali Sallallahu After praising Allah, you send salutation upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Nabiyyina Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa sallallahu ala Nabiyyina Muhammad. All these different versions, versions is absolutely fine. As salat al Nabi. That is number five. Number six, it is that you are certain, you have certainty that Allah will respond to your dua. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Call upon Allah whilst you're certain that Allah is going to respond to your dua. Ah, that is number. What's number is it? Who's following? Number six. Naam. Ahsentum. Good. Number seven. Are you sure that was number six? Huh? Naam. Number seven. It is that you not you are not hasty in your dua what does that mean that you're not hasty in your dua the prophet alayhi salatu salam he told us what that means he told us that it is the one who makes dua and he makes dua again and he said i've made dua i've made dua and he gives up he said khalas la keep making dua again and again and again while allah loves that you ask again and again and again and again and again and again while allah tabarak wa ta'ala ibn qayyim he says rahimahullah azza wa ta'ala i believe he says that allah tabarak wa ta'ala sometimes he will prevent you from getting what you want straight away so that you can he can call you towards his ibadah and that you can find that comfort in ibadah of allah tabarak wa ta'ala and that you keep calling upon allah jalla fi ulaha and allah azza wa ta'ala loves you more and you attain the love of allah and the pleasure of allah and the rahmah of allah azza wa ta'ala and then eventually you attain what you wished for as well the best of both worlds subhanallah so don't ever think that when your dua is not accepted why is it not to be accepted you're getting other blessings that you don't even you're not even aware of subhanallah that's the rahmah of allah tabarak wa ta'ala do not ever think that, oh, I've made dua, khalas. That's when you're not going to get what you, what you asked for. Because the Messenger Ali Salat tells us that when you, make a, when you make dua, it is one of three. Either Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will give you what you asked for straight away. That's it, number one. Or Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will delay it for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Uh, the day you need it most, you're going to wish all your dua was delayed for that day. Or Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will protect you from a calamity harm that is coming your way because of your dua. So every time you make dua, it is accepted. Ah, طيب. Look at this. 
the worst of creation. Sharrul khalq. The worst of creation. After disobeying Allah, committing his sin, he did something. Who is this? Iblis. Iblis was commanded by Allah wa ta'ala to prostrate to Adam. He refused. And rather, he became arrogant. Right? He disobeyed Allah when he refused. And on top of that, he insulted Adam. He thought, I'm better than him. Arrogant. So Allah expelled him from where he was. Expelled. Allah said that you are expelled. And accursed, distant from the mercy of Allah. And upon you is my la'na, the curse of Allah, ila yawmiddin, until yawm al-qiyamah. What did Iblis do? He made dua. قَالَ رَبِّ فَأَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ He made dua. He said, my Lord, allow me to live until yawm al-qiyamah. Look at this. After this, I made Allah, he made dua. What did Allah say? قَالَ فَإِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنْظَرِينَ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْوَقْتِ الْمَعْلُومِ Allah says, you'll be granted that. You're going to live until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Subhanallah, the worst of creation, he made dua. And his dua was accepted by Allah. What makes you think that my dua and your dua will not be accepted? You are a believer. In Allah you obey Allah you are a Muslim. Huh? 100% without any doubt, Allah will accept your dua. And the more certain you are, you are, and the more good assumptions you have of Allah when you make dua, you will attain that. Now, that is the etiquette that you should have when you're making dua. But on top of that, there are times the Messenger والسلام, tells us that dua is more accepted. Right? Between the Adhan and the Iqamah, you should make dua. Utilize these times. When it's raining, which is nearly all the time here, you're like, make dua, guys, in the UK, huh? When you're in sujood, your dua is accepted. When you're traveling, your dua is accepted. When you're fasting, your dua is more accepted. The dua that the parents make for their children is accepted. Huh? See the dua of your parents. The dua of your parents is always accepted. Huh? The dua that a brother or a sister makes for her sister in her absence or a brother makes for his brother in his, in his absence it is always accepted huh? the dua it is more accepted in certain places specifically al-masjid al-haram and masjid nabawi right and the masajid generally when you make dua in a masjid is different too when you make dua elsewhere it is more accepted right because it's the house of Allah wa ta'ala right so utilize these times in these places huh? when making dua the last hour of Jum'ah the dua is accepted when you're in sujood, it's accepted, and so on. طيب. Now we have understood some of the etiquette of dua. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he tells us that ad-du'a huwa al-ibadah. The du'a, it is ibadah. What does that mean? All of worship, it revolves around du'a. The more du'a you make, huh? The more Allah loves you. As the poet said, لا تسألن بني آدم حاجة وسل الذي أبوابه لا تغلق الله يغضب إن تركت سؤاله وبني آدم حين يسأل يغضب he said, do not ask the human being for anything. But ask the one whose gates and doors are never shut. Allah. Allah يغضب إن تركت سؤاله Allah becomes angry when you don't ask Allah. وبني آدم حين يسأل يغضب And the son of Adam, the more he's asked, he becomes angry. Ha. Ah. And he... Why do we ask human beings? We don't ask Allah as frequent. Human beings, they get annoyed the more we ask them, but Allah becomes happier and happier the more we ask Allah. Well, Allah loves you. SubhanAllah. And from that, specifically what the Messenger Ali specified, a specific form of dua and act of worship that makes Allah happy and rejoice, which is specified in the Messenger Ali, 
it is the act of worship which is known as at-tawba, repenting to Allah and seeking forgiveness from Allah. Because the Abd, the slave, he knows that every calamity that befalls him and every difficulty he's in, it is due to a sin. And Sayyid 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 Ibn Taymiyyah he mentions the statement and I found it very profound, subhanAllah. The fiqh, the understanding. He said, perhaps an individual, he will commit sins in secret and Allah will afflict him with a hidden calamity. And an individual will commit sins in public and Allah will afflict him with a public calamity. What does that mean? An individual, perhaps he does sins, no one knows about it, only Allah knows about it, in secret, right? And Allah Ta'ala, he afflicts him with anxiety and uh, difficulty inside. Only he feels it, only he knows, nobody else knows about it, right? Due to the sin that he committed. And when he repents to Allah Ta'ala, is the first step to get rid of that ham, that you know, anxiety and that grief and that sadness that you feel. That only Allah Azza wa knows that's in your heart, that is eating you up inside. It is due to your sins. The first thing that we should think of when we go through difficulty and hardship, it is that I have committed sins and I need to turn back to Allah Azza wa and ask Allah to forgive me because whether we know it or not, so perhaps we may sin and we don't even know, right? But there are sins that we have committed that have caused this to occur and I need to ask Allah to forgive me and that's the first step to resolving the issue or getting rid of the issue, right? And an individual, he said, will commit a sin in public. Right, and Allah will afflict him with a calamity in public, right? A difficulty in public that everyone knows about, either by shaming him, by exposing him, by making him go through some hardship that everyone can see and is apparent, subhanAllah. And that's very true. So when you repent to Allah, Allah becomes happy. Rather, Allah rejoices. Rather, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says that. And this is very beautiful as well. He says, "Ibtala Allahu ahab khalqihi bil maqsiya hatta yatubu ilayhi li shiddat yhubhi li tuba." Ah, he said that Allahu Azza wa Jal he afflicts the most beloved of the creation to him with sins. So that they repent to Allah Azza wa Jal and seek His forgiveness because of how much Allah loves repentance and how much Allah rejoices in repentance. Allah will affect you with a sin so that when you sin, you turn back to Allah Azza wa Jal and you seek the forgiveness of Allah and Allah loves you more and Allah rejoices with that. And that's why the Messenger Ali says, لَوْ لَمْ تُذْنِبُوا لَذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا جَاءَ بِقَوْمٍ يُذْنِبُونَ فَيَتُوبُ فَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ SubhanAllah, he says, if you did not sin, Allah will get rid of you. And He will replace you with people who sin and then seek forgiveness from Allah. And the Messenger Ali he mentioned a man who went out to the desert and he had with him his camel and all his stuff, his provisions were on that camel. And then he lost his camel. And then he despaired and he fell asleep in the desert thinking, that there's no hope. I'm going to die here. And then he wakes up and he finds his cow on top of him. And then he says, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He says, oh Allah, you are my slave and I'm your Lord. He, he makes a mistake because of how happy he was, how much he rejoiced. He made that mistake. He said, oh Allah, you are my slave and I'm your Lord, subhanAllah. Right? The Messenger Ali says that Allah is happy in that individual when you repent to Allah. SubhanAllah. Allahu Akbar. Right? So Allah Azza wa wants you to call upon him, seek forgiveness from him, ask him for whatever you want. And that is what strengthens your relationship with Allah. The more you call upon Allah, the more Allah will love you. Rather, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, O Rabbukum, ad'uni astajib lakum. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ And your Lord said, أُدْعُونِي Call upon me. أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I will definitely respond to you. I'll respond to your dua. Allah has given you that promise. Right? Dua. It's such a na'mah that we have and we don't realize how much of a na'mah it is. One of the a'imma, the scholars, his name was Imam Suhaili, rahimahullah azza wa jal. He has a beautiful 
munajat, a way that he used to call upon Allah Azza And I always love to mention this because he says that I never ever called upon Allah in this way except that Allah Ta'ala responded to my dua. And we're not saying that this way of calling upon Allah is sunnah, but that was his way of calling upon Allah. He said, Ya man yara ma fi dhaniri wa yasma'u Anta al-mu'addu li kulli ma yutawakka'u يا من يرجى للشدائد كلها يا من إليه المشتكى والمفزع يا من خزائن رزقه في قولك أمن فإن الخير عندك أجمع ما لي سوى فقري إليك وسيلة فبالافتقار إليك فقري أدفع ما لي سوى قرعي لبابك حيلة فلئن رددت فأي باب أقرأ ومن الذي أه ومن الذي أدعو وأهتف باسمه إن كان فضلك عن فقيرك يمنع حاشا لفضلك أن يقنط عاصيا الفضل أجزل والمواهب أوسع And the translation of that goes along the lines of this. He said, oh, the one, يا من يرى, the one who sees ما في الضمير ويسمع What is in the conscience and hears it. Allah, أنت المعد لكل ما يتوقع You are the one who is prepared for everything that's anticipated. يا من يرجى للشدائد كلها Oh, the one who we hope for, we call upon in times of adversity. يا من إليه المشتكى والمفزع Oh, the one that we flee towards and we only complain to him. يا من خزائن رزقه في قولك Oh, the one who his provisions are deposited in the statement of kun bi umnun fa in al khaira indaka ajma'u all of blessings and khair it is with you Allah ma li siwa faqri ilayka wasilatun the only way that I have to get closer to you ya Allah it is me showing that I'm in need of you the more I show that I'm in need of Allah Azza wa Jalla says it is me getting closer to Allah فَبِالِفْتِقَارِ إِلَيْكَ فَطْرِي أَدْفَعُ And the more I show my neediness to Allah Azza wa Jal, it gets rid of my poverty in the, and my neediness in the dunya. Ha. مَا لِي سِوَى قَرْعِي مَا لِي سِوَى قَرْعِي لِبَابِكَ حِيلَةٌ The only plan I have it is not on your dunya, Allah. فَلَئِنْ رُدِدْتُ if I'm turned away from your door, Ya Allah, what door should I knock on? Whose door should I knock on? وَمَنِ الَّذِي أَدْعُوا وَأَهْتِفُوا بِاسْمِهِ And who is the one? أَدْعُوا I call out his name. إِنْ كَانَ فَضْلُكَ عَنْ فَقِيرِكَ يُمْنَعُوا Who else should I call if you're bounties and your blessings are being prevented from your poor slave. حَاشَ لِفَضْلِكَ أَنْ يُقَنِّطَ عَصِيًا He says that your bounties and your blessings and your mercy, it will never make a sinner despair. الْفَضْلُ أَجْزَلُ وَالْمَوَاهِبُ أَوْسَعُ He says that your bounties are many and your gifts that you gift us, Ya Allah, they are vast. SubhanAllah. He says every time I I called upon Allah like that, He always granted me what I asked for. Because it's showing your neediness to Allah, showing that you're in need of Allah. Without Allah, you are nothing. And that Allah is not in need of you, you're in need of Allah. This is what dua is all about humbling yourself in front of Allah. Constantly repeating the same dua again and again, as the Messenger would do. He would repeat the dua three times sometimes. He would repeat it more times to the extent that before the battle, but then look at this, this incident, it's profound. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was promised that he would get one of the two, the caravan or the battle. Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not get the caravan before the battle, but that, so now he knows that the only option left is the battle that he's going to be victorious. He knew that before the battle. The night before the battle, the Messenger Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was 
making dua. Allahumma in tuhlaka adhi al-asaba falan tu'bad fi al-ard. Allahumma nasraka al-ladhi wa'adta ibadaka al-mu'mineen. Allahumma nasraka al-ladhi wa'adta ibadaka al-mu'mineen. Allahumma nasraka al-ladhi wa'adta ibadaka al-mu'mineen. He kept repeating, Oh Allah, grant us your victory that you have promised to us, your believing slaves. Oh Allah, if this group of men are destroyed, then you shall not be worshipped on the earth. Oh Allah, grant us your victory. He kept repeating the whole night to the extent that he raised his hands up so high that his garment fell off his shoulders. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Ya Rasulallah, qad alahta ala rabbik, ya O Messenger of Allah, you have insisted upon your Lord, you have asked a lot. SubhanAllah. This is the guidance of our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the example that we need to follow. This is your true weapon. Attach yourself to Allah. Detach yourself from others. Don't depend on others. Depend on Allah. Rely upon Allah. Call upon Allah. Ask Allah. Hope in Allah. Have good assumptions of Allah. And Allah Ta'ala will grant you what you ask. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from his righteous slaves. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept our deeds. We ask Allah Ta'ala to increase us in guidance. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us with those who attain Jannah to the those A'la. We ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive our sins. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who are guided. We ask Allah Ta'ala to show us the, guide, the truth and to keep us firm upon the truth. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who are steadfast until, yomal, until they die. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to utter the statement of La ilaha illallah before we pass away. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who are dutiful to their parents. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who attain beneficial knowledge and who act upon their knowledge. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to grant us guidance and to increase us in guidance and to guide others through us. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to grant us taqwa and to increase us in taqwa. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to accept our deeds. Innahu wali dhalika al-qadir alayhi. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I mean, did I finish, did I finish on time? A bit early, but I think we've got we've got a mashallah a lot of questions. If that's okay with you. Mashallah, tayyib. Bismillah, rahman, rahim. Hopefully, they won't bite my head off. Alhamdulillah. So we've got um, 24 questions, inshallah. So what we'll do is we'll start with the most liked question and um, go down from there, inshallah. Okay. So, so the most like question as of now is how to remain patient in extreme overthinking anxiety. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. How to remain patient in extreme overthinking anxiety. First of all, as we mentioned in our lecture, that dua is your weapon. And dua is the first thing that you need to do. You need to ask Allah wa ta'ala to aid you. I need to ask Allah for his assistance. And you need to ask Allah to remove this from you because it is Allah who is only able to do that. Right? That's number one. Number two, it is to do the, nece- or, or do the necessary things that you need to do in order to remove this anxiety from, your, from, you, from you. And the Sharia has told us what an individual must do in order to overcome it. Number one, it is when you observe the obligatory deeds and you perfect your obligatory deeds. Because what causes you to suffer from a lot of anxiety, not all the time, but for those who abandon their obligatory deeds, this is what happens to them. Because when you turn away from what Allah Azza obliged upon you, Allah Ta'ala will make this life difficult for you. And even when Allah makes life difficult for you, it's a ni'mah by the way, it's a blessing. Why? Because when life becomes difficult, where does everyone go? Allah. Allah is calling you back to him. Huh? So see it as a ni'mah that if you are far distant from Allah, this is a time to wake up and turn back to Allah. Right? طيب. Once we have discovered, we have perfected our obligatory deeds, it is doing the voluntary deeds. Or even if it's one voluntary deed that you find easy. Because our nufus, our souls are different. There's certain voluntary deeds that we dislike. That we find easy, right? Stick to it and constantly do it. 
Because when you do these two things, you know what happens? When you perfect the obligatory duties and you follow up with voluntary duties, Allah Azza wa loves you. And if Allah loves you, you know what happens? Allah will be your sight that you see with, and your hearing that you hear with, and your hand that you grab with, and your feet that you walk with. What does that mean? It means that you only hear what Allah is pleased with. You only see what, is Allah, what Allah is pleased with. You only do with your body what Allah Azza is pleased with. Allah will protect you from haram. And when you're far from haram and Allah Azza is pleased with you, Allah wa will grant you hayatan tayyibah. Because Allah says, Man amila salihan min dhakarin aw unsa wa huwa mu'min fala nuhiyannahu hayatan tayyibah. Whoever does righteous deeds, male or female, as a believer, will grant them a happy life full of contentment. So you need to take the uh, spiritual remedies first. And then you need to take the remedies of the dunya. S seek help. Do not try to face this alone, right? A lot of the time when you're going through this, you need to vent this, right? To someone that you trust, you need to seek advice, ask people to help. And this is actually what the Prophet Ali taught us. One day the Prophet asked him, he came to the masjid. And then he saw Sahabi sitting in the masjid. He names Abu Umama. And the Prophet Ali saw him, he said, Ya Abu Umama, why is it that I find you in the masjid and it's not time for salah? Why are you here? He said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I have been overwhelmed with anxiety and depression and debt. I've been overwhelmed with this. That's what caused me to sit here. I don't know what to do, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet Ali, so the first thing he did was, he sat with him and he comforted him and he listened to him. You know, when you, you know, vent all that's inside, you feel relief. Okay? So he listened to him. And the Prophet Ali, so he said, Ya Aba Umama, shall I teach you something? That if you do it, Allah will pay off your debt and Allah will get, get rid of your anxiety and your grief and your depression. He said, oh, yes, Ya Rasulullah, please do tell me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-bukhli wal-jubn wa ghalabati al-dayn wa qahri al-rijal. Powerful dua. The Prophet Alaihi Wasallam used to say this dua every morning and every evening. Whoever's going through this, this is your weapon. This is your prescription, huh? You don't need to take from pharmacy, you need to take from the library. Get Husl Muslim. The fruits of Muslim, you find it inside there. Okay? The dua, it means this. And if you look at the dua and you analyze it, you find that a lot of the matters the Prophet Ali is seeking refuge in Allah from, they are mental illnesses that lead to the other problems that he's seeking refuge in Allah from. He said, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from al-ham, which is anxiety, wal hazm which is depression, right? wal ajzi wal kasal being, not being capable of doing anything, wal kasal laziness. wa al bukhri wal jubn being stingy and being coward. wa ghalabati al-dayn wa qahri rijan, and being overwhelmed with debt and being overpowered by other men. Huh? And them oppressing me. You seek refuge in Allah Azza from that. When you ask Allah for that, no, that will happen. All that be go away. Abu Umama, he says, look at this. He says, I implemented that. I took the prescription. Mm. The prescription, it is that you say it once in the morning. You know, they, take, they tell you tablets, you have to take that this many times in the morning, this time in the evening. Dua, you need to take it. This dua, you need to take it once in the morning, once in the evening. Abu Umama, he implemented that. And he said, Wallahi, Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ala, removed my grief and my anxiety. And Allah Azza paid off my debt. Allah, Jalla fi Allah, right? Seek assistance, seek help, right? And inshallah, ta'ala, Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ala, will assist you. We are certain to have good assumptions of Allah. It's a lot of this, it is to do with what you think of Allah. Positivity is very important, and I can't stress how important that is. The more positive you are, the more you'll be able to cope with this. And actually, you won't only be able to cope with it, but inshallah, Allah will go to far to leave a way out, inshallah, ta'ala. So, be positive, have good assumptions of Allah, and Allah will assist you whilst coming with the necessary means in order to get through it, inshallah ta'ala. I hope that answers the question. Now. For the next most like question, inshallah, someone's asked, if your iman went down and you were struggling to bring it back up, you try so hard, but it's as if the soul doesn't want to do the good deeds in which you used to do, what do you do? It truly saddens them, they've commented. Good, good, good. Okay. 
Jamil, your question, it makes me very happy. Well, that might shock you. But your question shows that you are a person who is upon khair. Why? Because it is a sign of khair that you, when your iman is not at the level that you want it to be in your struggle with that, and you feel sadness because of that, it's a sign that you have iman. So glad tidings to you. And Allah wa ta'ala wants khair for you. Right? And just by you asking that question, it shows that Allah wa ta'ala is guiding you towards the path that inshallah ta'ala your iman will increase and you'll be able to attain that what you're searching for inshallah because Allah Azza wa says وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah says and those who strive for our sake who struggle for our sake they go through Difficulty and they strive and struggle for Allah's sake. Allah Azza wa says, subulana. We will definitely guide them to our paths. Ah, yani Allah Azza wa is promising you, number one, he's going, to, he's going to guide you. Number two, that Allah Azza wa is going to guide you to the paths. Paths of what? The paths of khair, the paths of goodness, the paths of guidance, the paths of all of goodness that will be like guiding to Jannah. Allah Akbar. So, your question, first of all, it's a question of khair. So glad tidings to you. Um, in order to revive Iman, in order to strengthen your Iman, Allah Azza tells us what to do. What increases your Iman, it is what you're doing right now by participating in gatherings of khair, doing acts of worship, right? The more ibadah you do, the more ta'a you do, right? It increases your Iman. But practically, I tell people, find an act of worship that you find easy. You don't find it difficult. Rather, you enjoy it, right? There's certain acts of worship that people, they enjoy. Some people enjoy, right, helping people. Some people enjoy giving charity. Some people enjoy, huh, reciting Quran. Some people enjoy listening to Quran. Some people enjoy praying Salah. Whatever it is, find a voluntary deed that you enjoy. Every time you feel like your Iman is decreasing, flee to that deed, okay? That is your prescription now. Huh? Take it that away, inshallah ta'ala. Free to that deed and do it, even if it is a little deed, but you keep doing it again and again and again, right? Until you feel that iman. That is number one. Number two, it is to be around those who help you, who assist you. Be around those who are righteous, okay? Because just by being around the righteous, it increases your iman, right? Because by the reminder of Allah, and that's why Al-Hasan al-Basri, alayhi rahmatullah, he says, ikhwanuna, أحب إلينا من أهلنا وأولادنا لأن لأنهم يذكروننا بالله والدار الآخرة وأهلنا يذكروننا بالدنيا. He said that our brothers for the sake of Allah, they are more beloved to us than our own families. Why? Because our brothers for the sake of Allah, they remind us of the Akhirah and Allah Azza wa Jal. And our families, they always remind us of the dunya. So being around our brothers for the sake of Allah, Tabarak wa Taala, we our iman goes up, and that's why. Um, one day, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he saw a sahabi known as Hanbala. And then they asked each other, how are you, etc. Then Hanbala, he said, Abu Bakr, I feel like, na'afaqa Hanbala. I feel like a hypocrite. And Abu Bakr said, ha, how comes? He said, because when I'm with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm only thinking about the akhirah. I'm only thinking about, you know, ibadah and so on. And then when I go back to my family, we think about dunya, I forget about all that. I feel like a hypocrite. And my iman is not the same. Abu Bakr said, I feel the exact same way. So what they do, they went to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, and they told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam about the situation. And the Prophet alayhi salatu he listened to them. And he said, ah. He said, if your iman was at the same level it is when you're with me at all times, he said, the angels will descend. The angels will shake your hands. Huh? Because of the lofty status that you attain. But he said, well, I can say, he said, an hour, an hour. What does that mean? Does it mean an hour doing halal, an hour doing haram? No. It means an hour of doing an ibadah and dedicated to the akhirah. And an hour that you give to your dunya and you give some time to dunya, that's what is permissible within the boundary of halal. Not haram, within the boundary of halal. Okay? You give time to that. Insha'Allah ta'ala. I hope that answers the question. Allah ala. Jazakallah khair, Ustaz, for the answer, Barakallah Fiqh. Next question, a, someone has asked, uh, it is, is it better to make dua standing up and for girls to cover, to cover their hair? It is, is, is it better to make dua standing up and for girls to cover their hair? Okay, 
it is, it is, it, it is not, not specified to make du'a stania. There are certain places in Saudi where it's reported to make du'a stania. I need to, because you to, to, to yani ask Allah Azza wa Jal with strength and to keep asking Allah Azza wa Jal, right? Uh, in places like Arafah, the Prophet Ali saw some very Arafah, he would be standing and making dua while standing. But whether, whatever you find easy, it's not a problem. If you find standing, making dua standing, or sitting down, it's not a problem, inshallah ta'ala. As for covering the hair, it is not a condition of dua to cover the awrah. It's not a condition of making dua to cover the awrah like salah. Salah, it is a condition upon males and females that they must cover their awrah, okay? And obviously from the awrah of the woman, it's that her hair must be covered in salah. As for du'a, that is not the case. If it's obviously outside of salah, okay, you make normal du'a, you don't have to cover the awrah, you don't you have to have wudu, right? So it's not a condition, wallahu alam. Now. Okay, that's that. Next like, question is, uh, when, when, acting, when actually being put in a situation when someone is constantly disrespecting you, such as a younger person, and is mocking you, and your frustration and anger is intolerable, and you, you, you want to lash back or hurt them with your word, how can you practically uh, discharge the anger and cool yourself down? Jameel. Okay, the, uh, first of all, the Prophet Ali he said, He said, ليس, ليس بالسرعة, من يملك غضب, من يملك He said that the one who is really strong, huh? the strong one, is not the one who is able to wrestle people and, mashallah, يعني, take them down. La, that's not the strong individual. He said the true strong one is the one who's able to control his, his nafs when he gets angry. Because anger, it is, huh? it's a desire. It's a shahwa. Right? And Allah Azza wa he says in the Quran, فَلَمَّا سَكَتَ مُوسَى الْغَضَبُ He said, when the anger went silent from Musa. What does that teach us? It teaches us that when you are angry, okay, what you utter, it is not you. It's shaitan. Right? So Allah says that the anger became quiet, not, not Musa. Because who the person speaking wasn't Musa, it was his anger. Right? You are someone else when you're angry. So the first thing you must do when you are angry is that you stay silent. And then you follow the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. He told us what to do when we become angry. Number one, he said to say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ To so seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Shaitan. Okay, that didn't help. You weren't able, you, you're still angry. You're still angry. What do you do next? He said, if you are standing, sit down. Okay, what about if you're standing, if you're sitting and you're still, you're still angry, you're furious, you want to uh, fight someone. He said, if you're sitting, then lie down. Uh, okay, what about if you, you lie down and you're still angry? SubhanAllah, you must have anger issues. <laughs> I'm joking. But if you're still angry after lying down, then the Prophet Ali, salatu salam, he said, uh, now, he said, go make wudu. Evolution. Go make wudu and pray two rakahs. It's impossible after making wudu and praying two rakahs that you're still angry. You can't be angry in salah. Huh? Mustahil. Impossible. Mm. So this is the guidance of Prophet Ali salatu alayhi he taught us in order to control our anger, inshallah ta'ala. And look, every attribute that we have, characteristics, okay, we can nurture ourselves, we can teach ourselves to adjust them. Because the Prophet Ali taught us that. He taught us you can adjust your character. To better it, he says, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, bi bi He said that knowledge it is learned, and he said just like that, okay, forbearance, it is learned by practicing it, teaching yourself to be forbearing by being patient, by controlling your anger. All these are different. Kinds. Forbearing is just one example, but all traits that an individual has, you can teach yourself to develop them through practice. Inshallah ta'ala. So practice it and ask Allah to assist you, and Allah will assist you. Allah will help. Now. Um, okay, someone had asked, what is the correct etiquette to make dua during sujood? What is the correct etiquette for making dua in sujood? Taban, in sujood, the first thing you say is subhanahu rabbil ala, because that's obligatory. After you said subhanahu rabbil ala at least once, then you can make dua, okay, after that. Okay, the question that may arise is, do I have to make dua in Arabic or, do I have, or, or can I make it in any language? And wallahu, yani, wallahu alam, yani, but um, what seems to be apparent is that you can make du'a in any language, inshallah ta'ala, but you should strive to learn Arabic, inshallah. Uh, but I do advise that you memorize the du'as of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, the du'as in the Quran, because they are the most comprehensive du'as, and in them is everything that you could need. So memorize them and call upon Allah Azza wa like that, in salah, okay, specifically in salah. Outside salah, call upon Allah however you like. Ask Allah whatever you like, inshallah, 
تبارك وتعالى والله اعلم. جزاك الله خير. Next question. How to remain patient in experiencing extreme waswas, mostly waswas with acts of acts of ibadah. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, first of all, waswas. Waswas is something that comes from Shaitan. Okay. As Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, "O men, shut the waswas and khannas." From the evil of the waswas, the one who whispers, Shaitan, right? And glad tidings to the one who has waswas in ibadah. Ah. One may say, ah, what do you mean by glad tidings? Shaitan did not find any other way to get to you except through your ibadah because of how keen you are in worshipping Allah. And that's a sign of khayr. So, now that we, have, we know that you're an individual who loves ibadah, you love khayr, he wants to protect your ibadah, Shaitan he uses that in order to make you dislike ibadah. He uses wiswas to make you dislike ibadah. That's, what, that's the objective. He makes it difficult he makes you doubt everything so that you keep repeating things again and again. It takes you ages to do acts of worship so that you find it hard and then your nerves starts to dislike it and you start to deep the ibadah. That's the plot of shaitan, right? So you need to understand your enemy's plot in order to fight and defeat your enemy. The first thing that you must do, for instance, you find people who have with worse when they make wudu, right? They make wudu, they wash their hands, okay? And then they move on to washing their nose and mouth. And then shaitan will tell, oh, you don't wash your hands properly. So they go back and they wash their hands again. And they wash it again. And they're told, oh, there's dry, there's dry patches. Keep going again and again and again. That individual, I advise them, when you make wudu, for instance, the one who suffers from waswas and wudu specifically, every limb wash it once. Okay, that's obligatory. More than once is sunnah. Wash it once and move on. Once you washed it, do not go back to it. If you go back to it, you are sinning. Okay, you are sinful. Because you listen to shaitan, he's going to make you fall into sin. Ma'asiyah. Okay, ignore it. Wash the limb once you see it's wet, move on. Okay, the same thing with salah. First thing the Prophet ﷺ teaches us when he gets with verse in salah, say, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem and blow to your left side three times. Dry spit. Three times to your left. And carry on. Because one of the Sahaba, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I get a lot of whispers in my salah. Okay. I keep thinking that I maybe broke my wudu, this happened, etc. I get all these wisdom from shaitan. The Prophet Ali told him to say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, and to blow to his left three times. And he said, I did that, and all that I was suffering from, it went away. You need to take these remedies of the Prophet Ali seriously. You can implement them. Once you implement them, okay, and you still suffer from it, then we look for another solution, right? But start with this first, because that is where the solution is, inshallah ta'ala, wallahu a'lam. Now, uh, inshallah ta'ala that will be the end of the Q&A session Wallahi, I just want to say Jazakallah khair Ustaz Yahya for the beneficial reminders there are so many um, points that we could learn and so many tips uh, of uh, you know uh, how, how to acquire patients and the different types of patients as well as you know very beautiful advices from Sheikh Ustaz Ibn Taymiyyah Ali Rahimahullah you know Jazakallah khair for the amazing answers that you gave I mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in this world in the hereafter Jazakallah khair Ameen Jazakallah khair Ustaz Yahya Jazakallah khair Ustaz I thank you for inviting me and for having me and I ask Allah to reward you all for your efforts and to put it on your scales of good deeds you're doing a great job mashallah even in these times yani, mashallah, yani, you're organizing these conferences mashallah. we see she have mashallah ah, you look different, you look younger subhanallah, assalamu alaikum barakallah for sheikh Inshallah, after Corona, we will see you in person. We will see in person. We will see you after this pandemic. We will see you after this pandemic. We will see you after this Inshallah. I'll take you to eat, Inshallah. Inshallah, I'll be on it. I'll take you out to eat, Inshallah. I'll take you out to eat. As long as I don't have to be in Even those who are listening, hopefully they're not a lot. Okay? Are there many listening? 108. No, I'll take that back. I will take you out to eat. Allah <laughs> 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 <laughs>